Hey everybody, welcome to Build Fly Go. So I have myself and my buddy Brad here, and uh, we're looking at uh, my RV9 today. Um, you may notice Brad is wearing a Garmin shirt. It is not relevant to this video, but there will be more <laughs> later. Yeah. yeah <laughs> um, Brad is building an RV10. Yes, another RV10 builder. So we're in actually pretty close where we are in the build, yeah, I right? I think we both have our cabin tops currently uh -huh. on, so we're really neck and neck. You're definitely a faster builder than I am, but <laughs> we have a lot of fun stuff to talk about today. That's right. Surrounding projects. And we're gonna walk around the RV9 and look at things, like choices that I made um, that may or may not be stock, um, that we're considering for both of our RV10s, right? Or just discuss what has worked, what has not worked, yeah. and take it from there. Yeah, definitely. Let's take a look. All right. So just quickly starting on this side, um, we'll notice the, these are Skybolt fasteners um, and they're not sort of stock to um, any of the RV kits, right? This is, the, the RV has, I think it's a, a hinge? They had the, cow, the piano hinge is what they refer mm -hmm. to it as. So entire length of the piano hinge on there. And functionally it works really well. It does exactly what it's supposed to. Um, I, I like the looks of the, the Skybolt fasteners, mainly on the RV10s, and we kind of talked about this. Uh, van solution on removing the pins for the RV10, they actually terminate right here at the top of the firewall, so it's really exposed and pretty open. Right. Um, versus some of the other model RVs, you probably are, uh, some of the, the two-place RVs, you could pull the pins from inside the cowling, mm -hmm. but the RV10, they come external to the top. So oh, interesting, yeah. I like your solution on using the sky bolts. I, I'm planning at least for the firewall uh, and then possibly doing the piano hinge up the side just because it gives that nice seamless look up the front of the cowling, but I, I think on the the firewall, I'm looking at the sky bolts, very similar to what you have on, on this airplane. Yeah, so I have no experience with the hinge on any of the RVs. I have, there's a couple of RVs on the field that have the hinge and it seems to work fine. Everybody seems to struggle with it though. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not... we, so based on previous experience, my, my dad owned an RV8 that I was able to fly and they, if you keep them fairly lubed and free, they, they tend to do just fine. Um, it takes a little bit more work to get those hinge halves to pop together right. a little bit more, but it's, it's another technique thing, uh, mm -hmm. like everything else. Once you have the technique down, it's pretty simple to use. Sure. I think I'm going to do the sky bolts on, on my 10 as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I like the way it it looks and it wasn't hard to do. I mean, the, the big downside of course, is it's another, what, like 600 bucks for that kit or yeah, something like another, that. Another add on. Yeah. Yeah. Another add on, another deviation from the plan. So it does take longer than just doing the, the hinges. Yeah. Um, but I think it's worthwhile. I think if you do the firewall only at the cost there, you know, yeah. maybe only be 300 bucks. So it's not as bad. I know I already have a lot of leftover hinge material in my kit mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure out where all I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. But I think for the firewall, that really takes up a lot of, if you measured the linear feet, it would probably surprise you how much hinge yeah. material you use. But very functional, um, but I, like you said, I think the sky bolts are just attractive on the airplane also. Yeah, I agree. I, as we were talking, I just noticed the uh, oil door. So this is a hidden hinge system. You could just buy this from like any of the usual vendors. Um, and instead of the, I think it's just a regular hinge that the Vans does, right? right. Like it's just a regular hinge uh -huh. and then two fasteners here. Um, I've got this nice, you know, it's, it's inside, it's behind it. Um, and this is just a, I don't know, it's like a somewhat stock. Here we go, it's a cam lock. Can we read that? It's a Camlock KM610-64. Mm -hmm. uh, just a little push button um, instead of the quarter turns. Um, it it works. It looks nice. I think I liked that a little better than just a hinge. Yeah, I I would agree with you. I would also plan on the nice flush fitting hinge mm -hmm. door, and and like you said, usually just a couple butterfly yeah. style latches here, and then the exposed hinge. Um, 
One thing about exposed hinges like that is when your painter paints them, that's a perfect spot that the paint eventually starts chipping off. Flake off, off that yeah. Hinge just because of the movement of it. So I like your solution here where you have the hidden spring loaded door. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it looks really nice. So I, I definitely, that's another aftermarket choice I would really like to see on, yeah. on an airplane as well. And these are not expensive. I want to say this was 25 bucks. Where'd you buy it from? I think Spruce. Spruce, they have probably several. They have, there's, there's, I've only ever seen one manufacturer of okay. the, this little hinge kit. Like I'm, the, the hinge itself is just a normal like spring and a pin and whatever, right? It's yeah. just someone has um, formed this mm -hmm. and sells it as a hinge kit. Yeah. Uh, but Spruce has it, and I think Stein has it, right? It's it's not a hard to find thing. Cool. Okay, so lights. Um, so you've all heard me talk about the fly LEDs that I have. This is the fly LED. I think it's the original kit. It was one of the first ones. There's a different kit now that has um, taxi landing lights built into here. And I also have the, I think it's called the Seven, Seven Sun? Stars. Seven Stars. Mm -hmm. And this is like daylight bright um, and highly recommended. And this is probably what I'm going to be doing on the RV-10. Mm -hmm. But you're thinking about doing something else, right, Brad? Yeah, I was looking at the Fly LEDs. Or, well, you have the Fly LEDs. I was looking at the Aero LEDs product. Yep. So I, the Fly LEDs, they have that new works kit that looks really nice where they take a few of these spotlights uh -huh. and add them to... Uh, the outboard bay here of that light, so it looks really good. But when talking to the Aero LED guys, they're good salesmen. So yeah. <laughs> they have they have a new light called the VX, and it's an integrated uh, taxi and landing light here on the outside. But for those who don't like fiberglass, it's more fiberglass work because you actually cut this opening up a little bit um, for the fly LEDs light. So your cut will actually come larger back here. And then you'll actually have a portion here, the wingtip you cut out. Mm -hmm. And so it has a new assembly. It makes a much larger uh, light assembly out here. Uh, but that allows the landing light portion to be angled forward. And oh, you can shoot more light over in front of your nose. Okay. So that has been one of the complaints about this style of landing light. People putting landing lights in mm -hmm. the tips. So they just don't get any light in front of the nose. So... Uh, what's nice about having that style of light is I did not cut these holes in Inch? my wing skin. Okay. So I know, I think on the RV-14, some of the current kits, Vans already punches this cut out for you. Uh -huh. That wasn't the case on my 10. I did quick build wings, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to come in here and mark this off and try to you know, router that out and jet sure. and edge that out. So I think right now I'm going to have the, uh, the Aero LEDs lights, the Pulsar out there for the Aerosun DX, and then uh, I'll have the Pulsar uh, nav and strobe lights, uh, just the, your usual form factor, um, you know, nav strobe light that they bring to the market. But sure. one thing kind of custom that I'm looking at maybe adding to mine as well is on the RV-10, our wing attach points are outside the fuselage. That's right. It's much so bigger my, gap there. My fairing here is actually more like that wide. So for scale, this is about three inches. Right. Right here. There's, you know, kind of a hand a size. Hand. And yep. really, the RV-10 is really about that wide. Yep. So what I'm thinking about doing is going like, you know, big airliner 747 style. <laughs> in the front of my fairing here actually uh -huh. cutting out a small portion of the front of that and using the uh. kits and basically you can buy those individual spotlights sure uh from either aero leds or you can buy them from fly leds and what i'd like to do is mount single spotlights in uh -huh. my inboard wing root fairing here interesting and because the nose actually will narrow up a little bit uh -huh. this will give me another avenue to possibly take some of my light at the inboard portion of sure. the ring and shoot it out up and front straight of the forward nose. So oh i like that i would actually have dual inboard spotlights going out straight ahead and then the outboard lights as well and every every line boy in the country is going to hate me at night because it's just <laughs> gonna be, it's going to be blinding but the leds are so amazing the power draw and technology yeah to it so i think that'll be Kind of my dream plan. I may add the inboard inboard lights later on, but I think that would be, you know, the concern of outboard landing lights is always light in front of the nose. And sure. I think if I could just put a spotlight in front of here, I think that would really take care of my problems with that. That's a really interesting idea. I might 
look at that as well. Mm -hmm. Because I think, and I need to look at this, but I was looking at the plans yesterday and I noticed that there's like a, there's a strip here and there's nut plates on both mm -hmm. sides. So I'm wondering if there's a second half that goes this way. Yeah, it's there's, split. I think these, they, I believe they split on the top. Okay. Top or bottom. So they do, they do split up here. But okay. another thing is uh, there's some structure you may have to uh, work around in here. Uh, Vans does have a tank angle mm -hmm. attach here. Yep. And they've communicated that that, that may can get rid of not that. quite be necessary. So I'm not sure how I'm going to handle that just yet. But it's optional. But what that lets me know is, you know, those spotlights are really, they're not too they're deep. They're not deep at all, yeah. So with this piece not being required, I'm wondering if I need to open up an access hole there to pass some of the cooling um, you know, pieces for that, for the light, or if my I light's too long. Uh -huh. I may just be able to open up a, a, you know, use a unibit and open up a hole for that to where my light may be able to pass through that sure. portion there. Uh, of course, always need to check with Vans on type of modifications with that. But yep. I know there's one other RB10 that's currently using inboard lights. I forget who has them. I just uh, briefly saw it on one of our RB10 Facebook groups. Um, like I said, I can't quite remember who it is, but there's somebody out there who's done it. So at least somebody's pioneered what to do with that so far. Uh, maybe I just follow, follow the leader on that one. That's one of the things I'm really looking forward to about Air Venture coming up in two months? Month and a half? A month and a half. Yeah. Like is, six weeks right now. Because, I mean, at least for me as a builder, a big part of getting ideas is looking at airplanes, mm -hmm. right? Like you look yeah. at how somebody did something, and you might not do exactly the same thing, but it sort of like sparks that, like, oh, I could make this yeah. modification. Like they did it like this. That makes me think of this other thing I can do. And we didn't get that last year, right? So I think all of us are sort of itching for like, yeah. let's go look at airplanes and see different things and just like keep, keep that keep that moving in our heads. Right? Yeah, definitely. So this is actually something that came up. I was just thinking about um, last night on when I made my decision on which pedo to use. This is the GAP26. Gap 26. Gap 26. And there are three versions of this. There's the unheated one, which is the cheapest. I think it's $299 or something like that, or $199. There's the regular heated one, normal heated. You just turn it on and off. And then there's a regulated version, which has a little control box that measures the temperature of the probe and gives you an alert if it's too cold. And then when you turn it on, it regulates the amount of power that goes to the pitot. So if the pitot doesn't get like burning hot, it comes up to a certain temperature, which is hot enough to keep, you know, ice from forming and all this kind of stuff. And I remember I agonized over this because yeah. I was like, do I want to pay, I think it was 449 or 499 for the, the highest yeah, I one. I think it's difference is 299 versus 449. That's about $150 difference there. Yeah. For the regulated, so. And I have the regulated and I've now flown 750 hours with this roughly mm -hmm. um, through all kinds of weather. And if I'm ever in the future given a choice between a regulated monitored pedo versus a regular one, I will always buy the regulated one. Yeah, I'm going with the regulated one also. Uh, there was a recent video of an RV-10 builder flyer that had a pedo icing event um, in his aircraft. And he, while he had a heated pedo tube, he did not have a regulated version. And in the installation manual of the G3X Touch install manual, there is kind of a certain setup in uh, Logic that you can uh, install that discrete input with. Mm -hmm. That comes from the heat of regulator box. So yep. the system can actually remind you when it drops below 40 degrees, hey, you need to turn your pedo heat on. So you can kind of trick that with the unregulated one, but the issue is the regulated box will tell you not just that you have your switch on, but that the pedo heat is actually working. Exactly. So you can yep. you can apply power to a pin and say, okay, have my switch on, but that doesn't quite get us all the way there. I want to know that my pedo heat is actually working when it is on. So uh -huh. there's a few different ways to install that discrete input and how that communicates with the G3X touch system. But in, to be able to get a warning at a certain outside air temperature, and then be able to verify that yes, my pedo heat is on and working 
uh, that's a really a really nice feature to have. Plus, when you hop out of your airplane and you forgot to turn your heat on, you won't burn your hand or something like that. Because <laughs> I have heard, I have not done this before, but I have heard that the unregulated ones, they do get very hot. They get very hot. You leave them on. Yep. So, uh, nice safety aspect there, uh, not just handling it on the ground, but mm-hmm. an air reminding you to yeah. get it turned on if you hit certain outside air temperature. Right. And honestly, for me, it's become the process, right? Like I no longer keep track of, am I going to be near moisture? Is it too humid out or is it cold out? I wait, like the light comes on on my panel and I flip on the pedo heat yeah. and then the light goes off like five seconds later. Yeah. And that's it. So if you're thinking, is this worth the $150? it is worth $150, right? Like I am stingy on all sorts of things on this, on airplanes, but this is worth $150. So definitely go for it. Yeah, cool. So this is something that people have asked me about quite a bit. So this is the mount for uh, the GoPro up on the vertical stabilizer. Um, you'll notice that there's a plate here that ties onto a couple of screws. Um, I made this plate the rest of this is flight flicks uh, they make this uh, sort of diamond shaped part and of course the uh, gopro style mount um, and they make a nice metal case as well um, the stock vans the stock vans install for this cap this is a fiberglass cap up here uh, actually has you riveted in place i recommend that you do not rivet it that you put nut plates in it and you put screws Right, these are just small, I think they're number eight screws or number six screws. And that way you can remove this cap if, if you ever need to, right? Like if you ever bash it up, uh, moving your airplane in the hangar, for example. Um, but then you can also use it as a mounting point. You'll notice that there's some USB here. Um, this is just a USB-C cable uh, that goes through here and it comes down. And in here, I have a little USB-C to 12 volt um, converter to power that camera. So when there, whenever there's master power, um, that camera gets power. And I would definitely not do that, not have a cable coming through here if this wasn't removable, right? Cause you don't, you know, someday I might want to remove this. I don't, I, I think I've got 750 hours on this mount now. <laughs> Some, someday I might want to remove this and I want to be able to like push the cable in there and tie the cable off. Um, but yeah, uh, this is usually black. Uh, this, uh, for some reason, this has sun faded. Um, but uh, yeah, it still works, and it's a great little spot to mount it. So we talked a little bit about antenna placement, um, and my my joke with the Garmin guys is always that the manual has all of these like guidelines for this antenna has to be this far, and this antenna has to be that far. So the only possible solution that actually meets the Garmin guidelines is to tow the antennas yeah, behind your airplane. 10-foot pole behind your airplane. Yep, 10-foot pole behind your airplane, one point this way, one point that way, and then you have the proper distance between antennas. But what you care about is what has worked for other people, right? So that you can maybe consider doing that for you. So on top of the, so this is an RV9, so not the same as an RV10. On top of my turtle deck here, uh, so this is the baggage compartment, baggage bulkhead. Right here I have my uh, GTN's uh, IFR antenna, WAS GPS antenna. Um, this, I want it to be outside the airplane. Yes, right. absolutely. Um, and Garmin is also very particular about wanting this outside the airplane, clear view of the sky, you know, no shadowing. Um, so I was very particular, you know, like when I'm flying instruments, it's the one situation in, in which my risk level is much higher when I'm flying than anything else. So that antenna goes outside. A lot of people put it inside in front of the, uh, in the engine compartment. Please don't do that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of heat stresses, um, environmental type of stuff that happens with Absolutely. You know, under cowling mounted. And also, you know, these have a note of do not paint on these. And so we don't want to mm-hmm. put them underneath the painted surface either. It attenuates. Like cowling yep. with like nice shiny metallic paint. Uh, yeah, definitely outside of the airplane, on top of the airplane, clear view is what we really recommend on those. Now, on all the installation guidelines as far as your antenna placements, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that have worked for a lot of different home builders out there. We break as few a rules as you possibly can when you're uh, installing these type of units because we have ran into some issues before uh, where, you know, signal issues uh, 
you know, maybe you have a common antenna mounted too close to the GPS antenna and that causes uh -huh. some degradation issues. So, uh, you know, it's really be smart, try to follow the guidelines as much as you can, but yep. you know, there's a lot of successful flying airplanes out there and it's That's a right. matter of doing what has worked consistently, uh, while trying to stick with the manuals as close as you possibly can. So I have, uh, you guys are aware, there's two comms in this airplane. Com one is on top and com two, let's see how dirty this is gonna be. Com two is on the bottom. You could just sort of barely see it there. I'm, I'm purposefully averting the video and shaking a little bit so you can't see how dirty the plane yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I did that because a lot of people put both antennas on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people put both antennas on the top. I find that antennas on the bottom in some airports uh, you can't, they have trouble hearing you. Yeah, it's the dual, I originally planned for dual antennas on the bottom of my airplane. The more I, more cross country, the more new airports I visit and fly to, I'm going to change that plan because I have had the issue where I'm on the ground trying to pick up an IFR clearance and I just can't get to a proper spot on the airport to get enough ground reception. So mm -hmm. that's where uh, you know, maybe doing your number two comm antenna on top. Um, the dual whip antennas on the belly look really nice and really yep. clean, but you know, when you're trying to use it, it doesn't really help you a whole lot if you can't talk to anybody. So that's right. Um, I think I'm going to go to more of a setup like you have by moving one of those comm antennas on top and, uh, just help me, you know, I don't, hopefully won't have any issues with that. Mm -hmm. and won't have any ground reception problems going that route. So for us, um, I picked COM1 on top and COM2 on the bottom only because it physically matches COM1 is on top, COM2 is on the bottom. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's good one. It's, it's less stuff for me to, like if I'm ever in a situation where I need to think about I'm having trouble with reception, mm -hmm. right? Like my, my task saturation is really high for whatever reason, I'm having trouble with reception. Yeah. There's less thinking of where is this antenna? Oh, the top radio is on top, the bottom radio is yeah. on the bottom. That's a good way to do it. The only I, the way I was considering thinking about it is usually if I have my ground frequency or my ATIS frequency, I'm usually on com my secondary com when I'm doing that. And Interesting. Because uh -huh. I'm on the ground, I was going to do my com two antenna on top because most likely my backup frequencies, ground, ATIS, um, uh, clearance, are you know are going to be on my secondary com radio. That way, I just like on like my GTN that I'll have. I like having the tower and approach frequencies on there and I'll take off and then I'll have my COM1 antenna on the bottom because that's my in-flight antenna yeah, yeah. and my primary radio. So sure. you can really, that's totally up to the builder of how you like to think of it that way. Uh -huh. um, it just depends what your primary use is. So exactly. there's not a wrong answer to it. Exactly. There's but, not a wrong uh, answer to this. You know, both both work, right? It's, it's how, how you want to do it. Um, other antennas, you saw COM here. Uh, my ELT antenna is right here. So this works pretty well for the uh, two-seat RVs, right? Like it's out of the way. Uh, there's probably not gonna be a good way for me to show this, maybe. Um, it's out of the way. It has good sky visibility just through Plexi. Um, different DARs are somewhat particular about where to put these. I have heard stories of some that, nope, has to go right here. They will not sign off your airplane unless it's right there. So it's not a bad idea to, to talk about that. Yeah, I think I think the manufacturer of the ELT says it needs to be an externally airframe mounted antenna. Um, like I said, I've seen mixed reviews on the DARs and what they'll approve. Technically, factory says they should be out here. I don't like the extra antenna. It's usually one of those kind of like wobbly floppy antennas. Yep. It just doesn't look good. I've seen RVs do just like you have it there mm -hmm. uh, successfully and no problem. What some of the 10 guys will do is, you know, we have a we have a bulkhead right here, uh, similar to what this bay station yep, is right here. Yeah. And you can mount that antenna pointed back and you can actually hide it underneath this fairing. Um, so I know several RVs have done that. Um, I think it works out fine. You don't have another antenna on the outside of your airplane. I, I really want to mount mine and hide it underneath my tail fairing, but um, just a caution for some of the home builders out there, uh, there's, there's some DARs won't let that fly and they, they want it outside the airplane. So hopefully I'm crossing my fingers. I want to put it underneath this fairing. If not, I will have to just simply move the antenna from here, you know, up to here yep. if that's kind of 
bad luck there. So yeah. we'll find out. Yeah, and my experience with DARs is, you know, talk to them before they show up, yeah. right? Tell them like things that. that you're aware that, mm-hmm. you know, may be complication factors, yeah. and they will tell you, I don't care about that, or yes, I do care about that, right? So that you don't waste a DAR visit, mm-hmm. and he doesn't sign off on an airplane. Yes. Hey everybody, thanks for watching one of our longer videos, but hopefully covered a lot of topics that people have been asking for, in particular the uh, mount for the camera up on the vertical stabilizer. If you are coming to Oshkosh, come say hello. You'll see me walking around and ask for a sticker. I do have quite a few of them. (laughs) We'll see you there. Have a great day.